Once again, Japan springs into action to make all of your augmented reality dreams come true. Officials in Fukushima have started building a research center they hope will help revitalize the region. <laughs> they hope will help revitalize the region. What the fuck? The facility will serve as a hub for those working to decommission the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. Local and Japan Atomic Energy Agency officials attended the ceremony on Monday in Tomioka town. The project is part of a government plan called Innovation Coast, which will bring high-tech industries to the disaster-hit coastal region of Fukushima. Up to 150 engineers and researchers from Japan and abroad will work in the new facility. They'll look into how to remove the crippled plant's melted nuclear fuel and dispose of its radioactive waste. Sometimes just think funny things. I hope it will function as a hub for researchers and engineers from Japan and other countries, bringing together their knowledge and accelerating this research. The center will cost roughly $12 million to build. It's expected to be completed by next March. Japan's nuclear regulator has decided to change its inspection procedures for nuclear power plants. It plans to inspect facilities without prior notice to operators. The review follows an advisory from the International Atomic Energy Agency in January that inspectors should be given more freedom during the checkup procedure. The Nuclear Regulation Authority currently conducts two types of inspections. One is checking the maintenance management four times a year and the other is inspecting equipment every 13 months. NRA officials decided Monday that inspectors can make unannounced visits to facilities, enabling them to choose main items to be inspected for maintenance. For the category of equipment checking, they will further consider ways to make improvements in inspections. The officials say they plan to introduce the new rules from 2020. When the mainstream press and the government says nobody could have predicted this, they're lying through their fucking teeth. Nearly 67,000 people in southwestern Japan are living in shelters or in their vehicles more than a week after strong earthquakes started jolting the region. Some evacuees have no homes to go back to. Others are afraid to return home because of aftershocks and the threat of landslides. Authorities say 48 people died in Kumamoto Prefecture in the quakes. They say 12 others have died due to stress and fatigue. Hundreds of rescue workers have joined the search for two people who are still missing. But rain has been hampering their operations. Health officials are concerned about conditions in the shelters. One person has already been diagnosed with the norovirus. More than 15 other people were taken to hospital. At night, there are about a thousand people crowding into the shelter, so it's extremely difficult to keep things clean and sanitary. Health officials say all of the people were staying in the same junior high school. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe visited a village in Kumamoto to meet with evacuees. We realize there's a lot of concern about the continuing earthquakes, but we'll do everything we can to support you. Rescue crews in southwestern Japan have discovered another victim in the series of earthquakes that has been rocking the region for over a week. Police have confirmed that it is one of the two missing people they have been searching for. The body was found at a site of a massive landslide in Kumamoto Prefecture. Authorities say 49 people died in the quakes. They say 13 others died later, possibly due to the physical burden of evacuating or the worsening condition of diseases they already had. More than 48,000 people are living in shelters or vehicles. And not being able to move around much in their cars is taking a toll. Officials say 35 people have been diagnosed with so-called economy class syndrome and need to be admitted to hospital. The syndrome causes blood clots to form and could lead to death. Recovery work is ongoing and on Monday the central government took a step forward to help rebuild the region. We have designated the damage caused by the earthquakes in Kumamoto as an extremely severe disaster. We have also decided on special measures to be applied to the affected region. 
The designation allows Tokyo to provide bigger subsidies to municipalities in the disaster hit areas. One elementary school in Kumamoto City resumed classes after an interval of 10 days. I'm looking forward to seeing my classmates. I want to play in the yard with my friends. School officials say they also plan to provide counseling for the children. If you like NECA wafers, the original candy wafer, yeah, that's a category that really took off. There's no need to watch this video. You're going to get screwed no matter what. Agriculture ministers from the group of seven countries have discussed ways to achieve global food security for the world's growing population. The ministers are holding two days of talks in the central Japanese city of Niigata. The chair of the meeting, Agriculture Minister Hiroshi Moriyama, told the participants that the global agricultural industry is changing year by year. We will talk about agriculture-related concerns shared by the G7 nations and come up with concrete measures to overcome the challenges. The ministers discussed concerns that the growing global population and changing diets could lead to food shortages. They also talked about promoting further research and development to increase food production and reducing food waste. They agreed that they should limit the use of medicines in livestock to prevent the spread of drug-resistant viruses. The outcome of their discussions will be compiled as the Niigata Declaration on Sunday. The 2020 Tokyo Olympic and Paralympic Games finally have logos. The original designs were scrapped amid accusations of plagiarism. And the process to select replacements was a long one. NHK World's Yuji Osawa reports. These indigo and white checkers will soon be printed on jerseys, souvenirs and signs for the 2020 Games. They reference Ichimatsu Moyo, a traditional Japanese pattern. Varying in size, they represent different countries, cultures and ways of thinking. And they carry a message of unity in diversity. It took a long time to draw this design. I feel like it's my child. I hope the emblems will be used in many ways and be known to many people. I like it. It has a sense of Japan. I think it's okay. It's unique. In July, the original design by art director Kenjiro Sano was unveiled. But a Belgian graphic designer called on the International Olympic Committee to prevent the logo's use. Olivier Deby said it closely resembled one he created for theatre in Belgium. Sano denied the accusation. But further accusations against his company emerged. And in September, the organizers of the Tokyo Games withdrew Sano's logo. They faced criticism of a lack of transparency in the selection process. So they formed a 21-member panel made up of a range of experts. Application requirements to design the logo were drastically eased, and entries increased sharply. There were 14,000, more than 100 times above the previous number. The screening process was made partially visible online. After considering thousands of comments, the panel selected the logo by a majority vote. It feels like we've come a long way to find the most precious one. The new logos went through a rare bundle of checks to ensure their originality. And it's hoped they will be globally accepted as symbols of the 2020 Tokyo Games. Yuji Osawa, NHK World. We pity your pathetic dependence on this web video for your weekly news, but here we go anyway. The operator of the Kyushu Shinkansen railway line says the bullet train service will resume as early as Thursday along all parts of the line. Kyushu Railway Company has already reopened some sections. An out-of-service train traveling on the line was derailed by the first quake on April 14th. Five of the six derailed cars have been removed and workers hope to complete operations on Sunday.
We require you to wear a jacket and tie to view this video, but your full-length evening gown is certainly acceptable, too. A group of former fishermen is to file a suit against the Japanese government. They're claiming damages for radiation exposure in 1954 when the United States tested a hydrogen bomb in the Marshall Islands. Twenty-three of the crew from one fishing boat were found to have been exposed to radioactive fallout. One died six months later. Around a thousand other Japanese fishing boats are thought to have been operating in nearby waters at the time. Family members and former crew of some of the vessels say the Japanese government failed to meet its responsibility. They say it neglected to monitor and care for the fishermen despite being aware of the radiation exposure. The government did not do anything to support the victims. The group is to demand about $18,000 in compensation for each member. In 2014, the health ministry disclosed that it had old records showing that it knew some of the fishermen had higher than usual levels of radioactivity. shoreline after sunset watching sea birds soar feet in the sand with my head in my hands there's luxury pushing us over harmony nature's great sanctuary Pushing us over oh. 